a round of applause. Hey. Hello, everybody. I must say, the organizers, um, Saran and everybody, have spent so much time uh, working with speakers to make sure that you guys have such a, a great program. So it's, it's a great conference. So, and the thing is, it's um, coming here today has really got me thinking about what it was like when I was a code newbie. Um, and uh, it's hard to believe, but I was a code newbie about 40 years ago. Uh, so, so back then, when I was a code newbie, we, we didn't have uh, a, a, a Twitter uh, channel. We didn't have podcasts. We didn't have uh, Stack Overflow. We didn't have GitHub or Linode. We did not actually have the web. We did not have the internet. And in fact, uh, if you wanted to run your program, you had to go to a special room in a special computer on campus. So writing code uh, as a code newbie 40 years ago was completely different, except that I think that um, the experience that I had when I got my very first program to run is probably very similar to the uh, experience that you have. And the frustrations that you have when your programs don't run, uh, also the same thing. And one of the things that, um, I, that really got me going into programming was the ability for me to just think something in my mind, type it uh, a little bit, and then all of a sudden I've built something. And so that kind of um, um, uh, thing that programming lets you do uh, really got me hooked. And uh, for the next 40 years, I've done nothing but write code almost every day. Um, you know, most people my age have veered off into management or business development or some crazy thing like that, but not me. I always say no, uh, just let me write the code. So that's what I do. Every day I write code. Um, now about 15 years ago, I got to sort of combine the streams because my other great passion was music. I was a, a frustrated musician when I was in high school. Uh, I, being a trombone player does not get, have a strong <laughs> career arc, <laughs> but, um, but the, the, the I, I found that um, about 15 years ago, I got to combine these streams and start to work in the music tech business. And about 10 years ago, I started working for a company that eventually got uh, acquired by Spotify. So now, every day, I go to work at Spotify, and I spend my time thinking, again, thinking about how to improve the listening experience for all of uh, Spotify listeners. Uh, then I type a little bit, and some magic happens. So. Um, why do we care? So when I was a code newbie, this was uh, the awesome music technology. For the first time, you could actually bring your music with you. You couldn't fit it in your pocket. It had to go in your belt. But uh, this really transformed, uh, transformed music back then. All of a sudden, people were running because they could listen to their, their tunes. Um, so about um, 25 years later, our friend Steve Jobs, he put 1,000 songs in our pocket. So now we could take our entire music collection and listen to it on shuffle. What a great music experience has transformed uh, music listening. And we have 15 years uh, later, we have companies like Spotify and Apple and Google and Amazon. They're basically putting all of recorded music in your pocket. You're just uh, a tap away from being able to listen to, to any song that you want. But this uh, causes a bit of a problem. So you, you have 30 million songs in your pocket. What are you going to listen to next? Right? So this guy, he's probably done listening to his My Chemical Romance, and he's, <laughs> right, what's next? So, um, so uh, one of the things we need to do at Spotify to keep people on the service so they're just not listening to that Bon Jovi they listened to it in high school is uh, to help them organize their music listening, help them discover new music. Um, basically, we're, you know, the holy grail is a magic play button on your phone that automatically always plays exactly what you want to hear. Uh, we're not there yet, but that's the kind of, of stuff that we do. So how do we do this? Well, it's all about data. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about the various kinds of data that we use at Spotify to try to improve the music listening experience. And along with each of the, these types of data, I'm going to show a few different experiments that we've done. Oftentimes, the experiments are whimsical, but they're also capturing a little bit of the essence of the kind of music experience you may be getting in the future of Spotify. Now, the title of this talk is, uh, what was it? Something about big data and music. So that's basically, <laughs> that's basically so you can show your managers, oh, I'm going to talk about big data and they'll approve your, your <laughs> budget. But really, the, the real title of the talk is Hacking on Music. So let's get right into it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, is music metadata. 
So music metadata is basically the facts that surround uh, your music. So when you play a song on Spotify, you say, oh, it's El Scorcho, and it's by the artist Weezer, and it's from uh, the Green Album. Is it? Yeah, no, Pink, Pink. Pinkerton, I forget, it doesn't matter. Uh, and there's album art and there's album releases, a whole bunch of facts around music, right? And this is sort of basic table stakes for any music service, you have to get this data right. Well, it turns out this data is actually really hard to get right. Let me just show you a few examples. Um, let's say uh, you wanted to answer a very simple query, what are the songs on the album White Christmas by Bing Crosby? Seems fairly straightforward, well the answer is really impossible to say because Bing Crosby has 40 albums called White Christmas. <laughs> they all have different tracks, it's different album art, different performers. Now, Bing Crosby, he, he had a cow called White Christmas and he milked it every, every year, <laughs> nonstop. So a few other challenges. Back, back when I was a code newbie, the The was a band, you try searching that into a, a search engine, you got nothing left, right? You've probably heard of the band Duran Duran, but did you know there's a band called Duran Duran Duran? <laughs> yes, there's a, a band called DJ, Son, uh, DJ Donna Summer, there's Glass Teeth, Chick Chick Chick, Crosses, Unpronounceables, and then there's um, the, the artist that should burn in hell. Um, <laughs> he's an electronic music, musician from Germ Germany, and his, he goes by the name Various Artists. <laughs> All right. So just a few other little uh, things. You know, there's at least 22 bands called Eclipse on Spotify. So if you're a big fan of the Utah Vocal Choral Group, and we happen to uh, play you music by the Ukraine Brutal Death Metal Grindcore Eclipse, you're not going to be a happy listener. All right. So um, we, I, I know you got some math geeks in here. I'm pretty sure. So here's a little pop-up quiz. Didn't know there was going to be a quiz. Why is this formula troublesome for people trying to build good music listening experiences? Shout it out unless you've been at one of my talks before. Anybody? No? All right, it's a hard one. It's because this is the name of a song by Aphex Twin. <laughs> so if you really like this song, what do you do, right? So almost all the services, they just call this song formula. So boring. All right, so we're going to do a quick experiment around metadata. I, metadata is kind of the boringest of the data. It's just facts. But we can try to do something really, really important, which is to answer a question from the internet. Uh, so um, a question and answer site, Quora. People go there and ask questions. Someone asks this question. Are band names getting longer? Clearly, it's important. Um, and so uh, this fellow, Zach Davis, who has those qualifications, he's named both his bands. <laughs> so he has some skin in the game. He says yes, but only very gradually. Um, and then he goes on and on and on and on to justify it. Well, that's not how you answer a question that had things been getting longer. You just look at, at the data. So let's find that out. You know, only thing we have to do is go through five year buckets, get the top 500 artists for each of those, calculate the average name, and we're done. In fact, the code is shorter than Zach's answer. <laughs> All right, so have band names getting longer, a little audience participation. Be brave. Raise your hand if you think over time artist names have been getting longer. Okay, some. All right, the answer is no, they've been not getting longer. The bit longest year, long, artist names were longest in 1955 to 1959. Well, what was going on then? Why were they like two characters longer than now? Well, here's some of the bands from, from that, that time. So you see there was this, this uh, style of naming bands back then, or the um, orchestra leader in the band, like Van McCoy and the Soul City Symphony Orchestra. So, so there you go. Um, just let's look at some of the, the longest popular artists over the last 20, 30 years. The top of my favorite, Tim and Sam, Tim and the Sam Band with Tim and Sam. <laughs> I think Tim and Sam realized they were cursed with short names and then overcompensated when they... <laughs> name. All right, so that's sort of a quick tour through metadata. Um, now we're going to talk about cultural data. So this is what do people think about music. So if you go out on the web, there's no shortage of places where people are writing about music. You know, there's music review sites, there's music blogs, there's YouTube comments. Lots and lots of text. So what we want to do is see if we can capture this text and try to extract some meaningful understanding of what the music that people are talking about is, is really like. Um, so how are we going to do this? Well, um, you guys are 
anyone familiar with the uh, metal band Dimmu Borgir? Okay, we have, all oh, right, four, five, six, nice, nice. So let's say you didn't know very much about them and you were kind of interested. You might go to a review site and read this kind of, of review. Um, you might start to, to pull out some descriptive words. So here we have words like black metal, 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 melodic black metal, unique, blah, blah, blah. Gothic, orchestration, Norwegian, run of the mill. So um, a, quite a range of descriptions, but you actually are starting to get a sense of the kind of band this is. Now this is just looking at the first paragraph of one review. So now imagine computers going out, scraping the music web, finding all of the reviews for this artist uh, and, and surfacing up all of these words. So in fact, what you can do is then take all the words, the phrases, these descriptive phrases for the band, start to aggregate them, see which ones occur most common. You start to get, the, we call them word vectors or term vectors, a really good sense of what this artist sounds like just based on, on these words. Oh, yeah, and so one of the things that we can do with, uh, with these words is to infer some notion of artist similarity. So here's two artists. We have Katy Perry, <laughs> Dimu Borgir. We can look at how their descriptive terms overlap. Um, so now we're only, I'm only showing like a dozen or half a dozen terms. Imagine these are 1,000 or 10,000 terms and we're looking at the overlap. So here, there's very little overlap. Uh, they're really just the decades. So if you're a Katy Perry fan, maybe you shouldn't be listening to Dimu Borgir. But if we look at someone like Britney Spears, you see uh, there's quite a bit more overlap. So they just, oh, they don't overlap with 90s and Disney, but in California, but the rest. So you almost say Katy Perry is kind of like a, a more up-to-date Britney Spears. And I think that's, that's fair. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> there's some joke in there, but I don't know what it is. That's okay. All right. so. So now we, so just to sort of summarize, we're crawling the music web, visiting every place people are writing about music, collecting all of these terms and phrases. We're uh, aggregating them up um, and using them as a way to summarize an artist. We look at overlapping terms to, to get a notion of how similar these artists are. So we're going to use this new tool of artist similarity to, in our next experiment. Um, and what we want to do is try to expose a listener to new music. But this is the extreme edition. So the goal here is to help a Katy Perry fan, yep, listen to Demo Borgir. <laughs> All right, so how are we going to do this? You know, if we just play Demo Borgir for a Katy Perry fan, you know, they're, they, they've left the room, right? So what we want to do is maybe we can uh, find a stepping stone artist in between. So here's an artist, Evanescence. You know, they're, um, if you're familiar with Evanescence, they, um, it's a female-fronted new metal band, so you see some overlap with Katy Perry's, like Guilty Pleasure, pleasure Female Rock, uh, Diva, um, and, but they also have an overlap with Evanescence and Dimo Borgir, like dark, melodic, metal, epic, and gothic, right? So that's an uh, artist in the middle. Now, it probably is the case that the, the going from Katy Perry to Evanescence is still a bridge too far. There's too much of a gap there, but we can get a sense that maybe we can find um, a, a path from, from one artist to the other. So how are we going to do this? I'm going to throw a big technical term at you called the BFG, which is a big freaking graph. <laughs> so what we can do is take all of the artists um, and connect them up in a graph so that um, to their nearest, say, 10 neighbors or so. And you end up with uh, uh, something that looks a little bit like this. Katy Perry, Dimo Bourguier, pretty far apart. And Evanescence is kind of the middle. Now, all the nodes in these graphs are artists, and the paths are, are basically, uh, if you're connected to from two artists are connected, they're similar enough that you could put them next to each other in a playlist. So then we're going to use Dijkstra's uh, shortest path algorithm. Everyone familiar with that from Algorithms 101? And we're going to find the shortest path from Katy Perry through Evanescence, maybe, and we'll end up with Dimo Borgir. So we have an app for that. It's called <laughs> Boil the Frog. So the, the idea of boil the frog, you've probably heard the old proverb, you put a, a frog in a pot of water and heat it up gradually, they won't know enough to jump out. It's the same kind of thing. Can we take a, an art, a fan of a certain artist and gradually bring them to a whole different type of music? Um, so, by the way, um, all these apps I'm showing you, they're online, and you can try them out. This one is hosted on Linode, just to let you know. Free ad. 
<laughs> so here's a, an example. We're going to type Katy Perry to Dimo Borgir. It's going to create a playlist of 10 songs. Um, we're just going to listen to the songs. It's going to see a gradual transition from one to the other. So that's Boyle the Frog. All right, so that was our lightning quick tour through cultural data. Now we're going into listener data. So listener data, every time you play a song on Spotify, there's a row in some a gajillion SQL tables that says uh, you played this song at this time on this device. And all this data used to feed all sorts of things like recommendations. So I'm sure you're familiar with you know, people who listen to X also listen to Y. Uh, lot, lots of really interesting things there. We also have people on Spotify create playlists. They create lots and lots of playlists. That's how they organize their listening often. So uh, what I want to talk about first is what can we learn from two billion playlists? Um, and so we're going to do a, a, a dive into this. So first of all, if you look at two billion playlists, what's the first thing you want to look at? For me, it's what are the 10 most common titles of playlists, right? So we can go through. Uh, all through two billion playlists, read the titles, count them up, see which one occurs the most frequently. And these are the top 10. Rap, chill, country party, house, workout, rock, gym, music, and road trip, right? So first of all, why are people creating playlists called music? <laughs> Anybody? I don't know. Um, but you also notice I've sort of color coded them. We have uh, the blue ones are genre related, uh, but the gold ones are um, they're context related. So people are starting to organize their music. Not I want to listen to hip hop or pop, but people are saying I want um, some chill music. I want some workout music. I want focus or study. So if we expand our window a little bit. Look at the top hundred playlists. Seventeen of the top hundred are genre related, um, and. Uh, 41 of the top 100 are context related. So really the learnings here is context is the new genre. People really want to organize their music more around what they're doing, their activities, rather than uh, a particular genre. So this is really cool and this is really interesting and really powerful for you know, when we want to try to improve the listening experience. Um, so here's an example of some of the uh, different contexts, your training and workout, you know, gym training, ski, snowboard, yoga. Uh, just to show a few examples, mood, um, people uh, chill, relax, motivation, 420, happiness, um, travel, car, road trip, on the road, commute, fly, travel, cruising, um, romance, sex, breakup, love, um, time, sleep, summer, 420, wake up, <laughs> morning, focus, um, work, study, school, yoga, flow, office, Probably should have 420 there. <laughs> and socializing, of course. So people, you know, there's lots of different ways people are organizing their music. So context is really important. Let's use this to organize listening. But context is hard. Um, music comes pre-labeled with genres usually, but it doesn't come pre-labeled with context. An artist doesn't say, this song is really perfect for uh, 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 a chill playlist. Um, so we have to figure that out. So how are we going to do this? Well, we have all the data. We have those 2 billion playlists with all these titles. 
So let's see if we can do this. Let's see if we can mine these playlists to uh, build really interesting listening experiences around context. Um, so that's what we're going to do in this next experiment. We want to see if we can, you know, for example, create a playlist of mainstream tracks that are good for uh, someone you know, 55 or, or over, a man. Um, you know, that's sort of the kind of, of intent that we want to try to satisfy. So how are we going to do this? We're going to start with our 2 billion playlists. We're going to search all those 2 billion playlists for the ones that have running in the title. Uh, we're going to find all of them. Maybe we get 10,000, 100,000 of them. Then we're going to go to all those playlists, collect all the tracks in those playlists. And lots of tracks are going to occur way more frequently uh, um, than they would uh, otherwise. And those tracks that occur lots, we note that and say these are probably good running tracks. And then we just do a little bit of filtering to say, all right, we want um, maybe it just for popularity because, you know, Ed Sheeran, he's really popular. His playlists, his songs appear in running playlists even though no one would run to them because he's just popular. Um, but then we can also filter by demographic. So, um, we can uh, get a, a good playlist for a particular uh, person, a demographic for uh, a particular activity. So if you do this for uh, running tracks for 55-year-old males, you get this kind of list. Um, you know, um, and you probably recognize this. I know there's a lot of people from Philadelphia here, so you'll yeah. recognize this one. So th that song came out in the Rocky movie probably about the same year I wrote my first program, just to tie it all together. <laughs> it's really sad. So and we can just tweak the filters. We can get um, uh, tracks for uh, an 18, 24 year old female. So everything else is the same. And this is the type of music they, um, she would be listening to. First thing you'll notice, that the 18 to 24 year old female is running way faster. <laughs> All right, going on a road trip, uh, an old guy like me is going to be listening to. All right, uh, a young woman. Time to turn the lights down a little bit. This is what I'm putting on. So smooth. <laughs> now, this is a problem for me because I have uh, three daughters are in their 20s, so I just look at this play. I don't even look at the titles. This, this is what they're listening to. <laughs> Go to your room. So that's it. And finally, time for the inevitable breakup. You notice, for the old man like me, it's all crying. <laughs> cry, cry, cry. Whereas the uh, young female, it's all about the F you. I want my stuff back. All right. All right, so that's a quick tour of using uh, playlist data to help improve uh, the listening experience. And actually, if you go to Spotify right now, if you type in a playlist name, don't put any tracks, you'll get recommendations using technology sort of um, at the root of all this stuff. You can make a 420 playlist is what I'm saying. <laughs> all right, so next, uh, another tour of listener data is using scrubbing to find the best part of a song. So people listen to songs, they normally listen to it straight through, but sometimes when people listen to songs, they say, oh, I want to get to the best part or we'll listen to that part again. So what we can do is, is look at, you know, millions of people are playing this song. We can look at the, their scrubbing behavior and we can start to get a sense for where the hot spots are, are in songs. Where are people scrubbing to in a song? Essentially, can we find the best parts of music just by looking at this data? So let's take the song by Phil Collins in the air tonight. If we look at the most common places people are scrubbing, you see this gigantic peak <laughs> down toward the end there. And, it, and so um, we think maybe that's associated with a really interesting part of the song. When, and if you, but that's not the most frequently listened to part because people listen after that. No one scrubs to the best part. They scrub just before it. So if you do a little integration, we get another curve. And this is basically showing us the parts of the song that are most listened to based on scrubbing. So we have two points. We have where do people scrub to? And then the other point is what point are people listening to most? So let's take a listen. You probably know where we're going with this. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> the, the, the amazing thing is, is this hotspot is so incredibly precise. So if you're listening to any like dubstep, it's a perfect drop detector. <laughs> Try a few more. I'm away to the beat going. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, so one of the things is, So you notice some of the peaks are really steep, some are not so steep, right? So we can we sort of call this uh, prominent. So what we can do is, we, like we can go within a genre and say, what are the most prominent peaks across a whole genre of music? And this gives us, what is the hot spot like in hip hop? What is the place in hip hop that people are listening to the very most? Um, and this is what we end up with. So like this may not be the best hip hop, this is maybe someone trying to learn a particular rap and you know, thousands of uh, 12 year old boys are trying to, <laughs> get this right over and over again. But this is what they're, they're listening to. Oh. All right. I, I gave the closed company people no warning at all. Sorry, good. How'd you do? All right, so it's, um, you don't have to just look at modern music. What's the biggest drop in uh, classical music? Of course, that's where the fireworks and cannons come in. Classic rock. And finally, for pop, it's all about the chorus. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, listener data. Lightning, uh, quick into acoustic data. So music is, is you know, MP3 files, it's just data, right? So let's treat our music as data. This is something we've been doing at Spotify for quite a while. We'll take a song, we'll do signal processing on it, we'll do machine learning on it, and we get a real sense of what the music sounds like. We know where all the beats are, we know if it's uh, alive, or uh, we know what the tempo is, we know how danceable it is, all driven from this audio. And one of the things, if you look back before recorded music, everyone, if you ever listened to music, you were always in the same room with the performer. Um, and this gave you this really wonderful opportunity to interact with your music. You could say, play the chorus again, or louder, or faster. You can't do that anymore. You know, our, our music interface is, is that, right? So I, I, one of the things I'm really excited about is using some of this acoustic data to try to bring back a much more interactive listening experience. So um, let's do that. Let's uh, look at a few things. Um, one is, um, you know, we know where all the beats are in a song. What if we could maybe improve a song by changing the drummer? Um, so we all know, um, uh, um, so this is an app called the Bonhamizer. So John Bonham, drummer for Led Zeppelin. Um, I, my theory is if he was a drummer in any band, that band would be improved. And so there's an app for that, it's called the Bonhamizer. You give it a song, it will give you uh, the song back with John Bonham on the drum. So here's an example. This is not Bonhamized. It sounds okay, but listen to this. Oh yeah. Nice big fat beats. Next experiment <laughs> is called the swinger. You guys know what swinging is. Your songs are often you know, straight up and down, but swinging you get a little dun da dun da dun. So that's what the swinger does. It will take a song, we know where all the beats are, and then we can make it swing by making the first beat a little longer, second beat a little shorter. Uh, so here's an example. This first example is a song, it's not swung. This is the input. All familiar with it? What's it sound like swung? Oh, way more danceable. All right. 
All right, um, we got just two more experiments. One is called, um, it's called the Infinite Jukebox. Maybe some of you have seen this on the web. The idea is um, you all have this song that you wish would go on forever. You know, that's what Infinite Jukebox does. So uh, we have a nice detailed understanding of what songs sound like. What Infinite Jukebox will do is as you're playing a song, it will look at every beat of the song and find to see, check to see if there's any other very similar sounding beats in the song. And if set, set of randomly, uh, instead of jumping to that next beat, it will jump to that similar sounding beat. And we'll kind of repeat this, and you end up with a, a version of your song that will go on forever, but it's always changing. So always changing, um, never ending version of your song. And so uh, what you're gonna see is you'll see sort of a, this blue playhead go through, and every time it flashes green, it's jumping to a different part. And this ring is showing the beats in the song, and the, the little connections are showing the connections between similar sounding beats. So here we go. So now we're in a different part of the song. We have to wait till it's over. <laughs> All right, last experiment. This is called the auto cannonizer, and it'll take your favorite song and turn it into a cannon. So a cannon is a song like Row, Row, Row Your Boat that you can play against an offset copy of itself, and it still sounds good. So the, what the, the way the auto cannonizer does is it will sort of analyze a song, and it will try to uh, find phrases that seem to fit musically, and and play the second phrase uh, at the same time as the first. So where you're gonna see these little two things, one's sort of the tape head that's gonna play straight through the song, and this one is gonna show you the different parts of the song that it's playing. In this particular example, it's by Izzy, who's a Hawaiian um, uh, ukulele singer. Uh, and this is, uh, he's singing by himself, so whenever you hear two people singing, that's the auto cannonizer uh, doing the work. So here's what this sounds like. I like the dark in the beat of my cell. What a wonderful world. Some kind of special kind of song, so pretty up in the sun. So that's the auto cannonizer. Um, so you know, I, I think back to when I was a code newbie, and I was also really thinking about being a, a, a musician as a career. Um, one of the, the things that was holding me back f from going on all in on programming was sort of this feeling you get around creativity, creating something new, something that, uh, at least in somebody's opinion, might think is, is beautiful. Um, but then I get back to doing projects like this and that same feeling of creativity, um, making something new, even if it's you know, basically remixing somebody else's stuff. It, it's, it's something that makes me really um, glad that I, I chose uh, the path that I did. So here we are at the end of the talk. So we've got 30 million songs in our pocket. We're gonna use all this data to improve this. Hey, you may be asking, isn't this kind of creepy, especially with all the stuff that's going on? Maybe, we can talk after. Um, <laughs> If I out you that you like uh, One Direction, is that so bad? Uh, <laughs> all right, so all of these experiments, they're online, or most of them, and, and some talks, so you can go to the Music at Codeland at Bitly. 
uh, and you can check it all out. And I just want to say, um, I think you guys here, you're, you're new programmers, you're on the right path. You obviously, you have enough passion and interest in this field to, to come to a conference like this. I, I don't have any uh, sage advice, uh, except from my perspective, what's been working great for me is one, was uh, write code every day. It's just like being a musician. The more you practice, the better you get. That's how you become a great coder. Uh, and second is, at some point, you know, the thing that's going to keep you writing that code is writing code about something that's really important to you, whether it's music or uh, robots or, um, or uh, helping uh, underprivileged com communities. Find the thing that's going to make you say, oh, even though I have t 10 bugs that I can't fix, uh, I still want to come back the next day and write some more code. So that's my talk. Awesome job. Make sure to give it for Paul LeMay.